Clay Thomas. I'm one of the chaplains here at Fort Hunter Liggett. We'd like that. And we'll be your MC for the rest of the time. Um, I want to recognize some of our distinguished guests at this time. We have the mayor of King City, Robert Cullen, here with us today. King City Council members, Karen Jernigan and Mike LaVar. John and Anissa, uh, An Anissa Balson. Ms. Balson is the great-granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst. We're so happy to have you all with us. And from Hearst Castle, we have Mary Levkoff, the museum director, and Victoria Kastner, historian, and also our guest speaker. We also want to give thanks to our community partners who have displays, many of which are in the room right across uh, the way here. Uh, Mission San Antonio, Friends of the Mission, San Antonio Valley Historical Association, and the newly opened Nassatone Regional Interpretive Center. We're so grateful for their help with this event. Also, we want to give thanks to our sponsors. Paso Robles uh, Albertsons donated the cake for today's event. Uh, ISG Hotels, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, La Quinta Hotel, and Quality Inn, Transact, ATM Services, and USAA donated the beverages for the event today. Thank you folks for all your support. Today's ceremony will honor the Hearst legacy at Fort Hunter Liggett. And we're very pleased to have Miss Victoria Kastner with the Hearst Castle here as our guest speaker. Two other events are planned this year to continue our anniversary celebrations. And the garrison commander, Colonel Jan Norris, will tell you about those events when he speaks. Today's agenda will start with the garrison commander's opening remarks, followed by our guest speaker. We'll then conduct the cake cutting ceremony and invite you all to view the historical photos along the walls. These images are courtesy of Hearst Castle, Cal Poly Library Services, and the Taylor family. Thank you for permitting us to share these wonderful images today. There are additional displays also that are outdoors and on in the uh, room across the hall. At 3.15, we're going to be conducting a windshield tour of some of the historical buildings in the area, such as the Gil Adobe and the Mission. Please board the bus if you are interested in that tour. Uh, the boarding will begin about 3 o'clock. At this time, with the garrison chaplain, Colonel James Boggess, please come forward for our invocation. Please join us in this prayer. Almighty God, we invoke your divine assistance and humbly ask for your blessing on all who are gathered here today. In your word, you prescribe time for your children to pause and consider their history, to remind them of where they have been and of how you have seen them through difficult times and how you are with them now. By reminding them of the past, both the successes and failures, you help them to take the lessons of history, apply them to the present, and plan for the future. Today is a similar time, a time we gather to look back over the history of the Valley of the Oak, and the history of which Fort Hunter Liggett is an integral part. Help us to be open to the lessons of history. Help us to be better stewards of our legacy, better stewards of our resources, and better people through the application of these lessons. As we pause to look back, Help us to understand how we reach this point. Let us be open to the truth, to the good and the bad, and enable us to pledge to make a better place for all who work, live, and visit the Valley of the Oaks. We ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the garrison commander, Colonel Jan Norris. Wow, pretty full today. Good, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to Fort Hunter Liggett and their 75th anniversary celebration. We, we introduced our guests, but let me let me do so again. Um, Mayor Cullen, uh, <coughs> Council Members Karen Jernigan and Michael Barr, welcome. Uh, Colonel uh, Nicole Balliette, Commander of Camp Roberts, welcome. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Balson, uh, great honor to have you here today. Mary Lefkoff and our guest speaker, Victoria Kastner, an honor to have you here today. Well, looking forward to hearing from you. I'd also like to again acknowledge some of our community organizations for participating. Uh, Mission San Antonio, Friends of the Mission, 
the San Antonio Valley Historical Association, and especially the Nassatone Regional Interpretive Center for bringing us the, uh, the chuck riding display you saw up front there. It's very uh, fitting for our theme today. Uh, and so we, uh, again, appreciate you all for joining us here. On January 10th, 1941, the Hunter Liggett Military Reservation was established. And the senior leaders of what was then 4th Army quickly began the arduous task of transforming the cattle ranch into an Army training base using this hacienda as their headquarters and uh, using the rooms we are standing and sitting in right now. And so this year we are holding three events to celebrate our 75th anniversary. The first event today focuses on the, the pre-military Hearst Ranch era as our guest speaker will soon address. The second event in early May will focus on the legacy and life of Lieutenant General Hunter Liggett, the man, and will include a visiting historian and subject matter expert. Our final event in July will highlight the military history of the base and include the unveiling of a 75th anniversary commemorative painting, which is being commissioned by Mr. Pete Dawson out of Monterey. And the theme of this painting will be soldiers uh, in the 1941 time period marching against the backdrop of the Hacienda. There will be uh, somewhere around 100 limited edition prints of the painting that will be made for sale uh, during our July event. Our final event will also include the opening of the Fort Hunter Liggett Heritage Center uh, to be located in what was formerly the Hacienda Cantina, for those who know the building. Um, while we have narrowed, a very important point I want to make here, while we have narrowed the historical focus of our anniversary events to the time periods around the establishment of Fort Hunter Liggett, we certainly acknowledge the long history of the San Antonio River Valley, where people have lived for more than 10,000 years, going back to the native Salinas through the homesteaders who settled the region in the late 19th century. So again, I thank all of you for coming today to celebrate 75 years of excellence, and we look forward to seeing you again at our next two events. I'd especially like to acknowledge our garrison workforce, both past and present, uh, our tenant units and our community partners for making Fort Hunter Lincoln a great place to train, to work, and live. It took 75 years to build what today is a world-class training center that enables readiness for our military to preserve our nation. To try and set the tone for our event, I'll conclude my comments with a few excerpts from the poem some of you may know, uh, Mel Petus by Moonlight, written by former Hacienda hostess uh, Eva Taylor in the 1930s. And this poem was inspired by her experiences working here in this, our nationally recognized structure. No penis by moonlight, there you stand, the past and future, hand in hand, on the crest of a knoll, Mission Hill surrounded, above San Antonio Mission, 1771 founded. Massive no penis, the oaks have portrayed, so it greets oblivion, unafraid, beauty which might have become just a memory of Mission architectural history, has been reborn for all to see in Milpitas Hacienda Cemetery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we are honored to have Hearst Castle's historian, Ms. Victoria Kastner, as our guest speaker. Ms. Kastner has written and lectured about the estate for more than 30 years. She has a master's degree with a specialty in architectural history from UC Santa Barbara and a master's degree in museum management from George Washington University. She's the author of the new volume, Hearst Ranch, Family, Land, and Legacy, and Hearst Castle, the biography of a country house, and also Hearst San Simeon, the gardens and the land. All three volumes are published by Abrams Books, and together they form a trilogy that reveals the fascinating history of this fabulous estate. 
Ms. Kastner has lectured extensively, including at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the De Young Museum, and the Getty Museum. She's also been interviewed on the Today Show, CBS This Morning, National Public Radio, and Australian National Radio. And now we have the pleasure of Ms. Kastner at our event, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Victoria Kastner. very much chaplain thank you very much it's an honor to be here and complete a circle um, really um, Milpitas is generally regarded um, as a name that was given this place by um, uh, native peoples and it, it has been translated place of the dead oaks it's also though uh, been given a, a different meaning and that is important gathering place which seems so appropriate today. Um, my apologies, I will be barking now and then with a cough, but believe me, the fact that I'm making any noise at all is a miracle of medical science. So um, uh, do, do forgive me for that, and also for uh, not shaking your hand when I meet you later. Um, and it really is the completion of a circle, and as I was driving in, the first sign I saw said Army Values. I didn't know they were going to be enumerated, I, you know, but it really struck me what I thought was the Army Values this place. It's so true that uh, they've been a magnificent stewards of this, of this very important property. And I want to say thank you to the commissioned and non-commissioned uh, people here and also to the members of the community that, that have made it an important place as well. And I thought you might be interested in knowing um, what its life was like uh, before December of 1940 when William Randolph first sold it to the Army. And believe me, it was not an idle choice. He wanted to make sure that it would be taken care of and stay intact and unaltered. And that has happened in the most uh, magnificent way. But before 1940, it was part of what was called the Piedra Blanca Rancho, named for the white rocks that um, are just north of San Simeon Bay. And it's not very often that you can see Cowboys, Cattle, and Hearst Castle all at one time, but, but there they are. And um, this was all one continuous property. Um, and it was, at, at its height, it was a quarter of a million acres. And, no, Peter Hacienda was a very important part of it. Uh, William Renner first started buying land here in 1921, and he loved this place, and he had a lot of fun here. Do you recognize this? It's right there. It's the cactus garden right there. Just uh, by the two-story apartment that Julia Morgan, his very talented architect, um, uh, built for him. And so I, I thought I would tell you about that, but also about this extraordinary family because all of us who live in the area are affected um, because they own such a large portion of land for such a long time and steadily resisted it being developed and then when a portion of it did have to be sold sold it to the right person or you know, recipient owner it, we all are, are the benefactors that's why we aren't an urban area and um, because this uh, coastal and inland property was once a, a vast ranch. And the story really started um, quite a while ago. We had our 150th anniversary of the Hearst Ranch just last year. So we're two months into our 151st year. George Hearst, who was born in Missouri around 1820 or 21, he wasn't really sure which, um, made a fortune in silver in the West. He left Missouri and a young schoolgirl named Phoebe Apperson, she was just in pigtails when he left, but it took him 10 years. Um, he found silver and then copper and then gold. He came back to Missouri and he married this woman. He was 41 and she had turned into a talented 19 year old school teacher who spoke French and loved education. That was in 1862. And in 1863, um, they, they traveled west to San Francisco, and um, that's when William Randolph Hearst was born, their only child. And in 1865, 
George Hurst took the money from that first big silver strike and bought land along the coast at San City. It was very famous for lots of features. The stands of, of uh, pine, somehow my, there we go. The vast uh, mountain ranges, the San Lucia Mountains, the beautiful coastline. Lots of people were mining in the area. They were mining quicksilver, um, which it was necessary to use mercury in the processing of silver. Uh, but George Hurst uh, did not mine uh, this area, even though he was such a renowned uh, gold, silver, and copper miner. Phoebe didn't spend much time in San Simeon. It was pretty primitive. She was busy educating herself and bringing culture and education to the citizens of San Francisco. George became a senator uh, late in life, but he was also an, a, a state legislator before he was a United States senator. And William, or as George called him, Billy Buster, pretty much got anything he wanted. <laughs> as a matter of fact, his mother Phoebe took him to Europe for the first time when he was only 10, and she wrote back to George, Willie wants to buy everything he sees. She said, I too confess the same temptation. <laughs> uh, so he was uh, really loved by his parents, but the time that he got to spend with his father was when they would come by stage sometimes, or by boat, by coast, coastal steamer from San Francisco, to San Simeon Bay and camp. Sometimes they stayed on the coastline, but sometimes they drove, uh, rode their horses up to a high prominence at 1,600 feet with a beautiful sweeping view. Later in life, William Randolph said, the road was so steep and the trail was so rocky. He said, I only managed it by hanging onto the tail of my pony. <laughs> But there was no place he knew longer or loved better than a San Simi. Sorry. Sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. George um, was urged to make, as everyone was doing along the coast of California, San Simi into a really going concern. It was a whaling port. This is sort of greater urban San City. Uh, there were two um, hotels, those are the large buildings. He built the, the Brown Building, which is a warehouse, and he built the 1878, oh, both, uh, they did too, the pier. There's a little pointed structure up the way, and that was the one room schoolhouse. But he never did turn it into a major shipping area. It's a deep water bay. It's a national harbor. The only one between here and Monterey. But he said, I'm saving it for the boy. Now, the um, town of San Simeon still exists. I believe it's the only estate village in the country um, that looks the way it did. Uh, the 1887 warehouse George built is still there. And there's a concrete building that his son uh, built later in 1930, also still there. And there was an important additional feature. George Hurst um, built a ranch house. It was the headquarters, and also it was a comfortable dwelling. And then Phoebe felt um, you know, inclined to come visit as well. So that was built, sorry, uh, uh, there's still here. Uh, that was built in 1878. My clicker's got a mind of its own here. Huh. Michael, it might have just, there it is. And it's a beautiful 18-year-old um, Victorian. And it's uh, not shown to the public. It's still used uh, by members of the Hearst uh, family today. And um, a very elegant, a uh, gracious uh, building it is. If you've been to San Simeon, as you uh, head up the road, it's on the left. There's a big grove of trees that shield it from view. But from 1878 on, Phoebe too came, and I, want, I thought you'd like to see, there's a bust of W.R. In, uh, uh, in the salon that he sat for, and Phoebe not only took him to Europe when he was 10, and they stayed a year and a half, but she took him again when he was 16. And together they learned about art and history, and, he, and she really started that love of collecting. And I've always felt that San Simeon embodies the love of both of his parents, his father's love for this landscape, and this portion of California, and his mother's love for culture um, and art. Um, he loved culture and art too, but he didn't think it was anything uh, bad when it was funny. And uh, he went to Harvard, and he's dressed up with those ridiculous shoes, um, for um, a, a theatrical event. 
He was um, a very intelligent young man, but not a particularly a, a dedicated student. He said it was an excess of political enthusiasm and a deficiency of intellectual attainment. Not true. I think it had something to do with putting a donkey in a teacher's office, hanging a sign on his neck, writing, now there are two of you on the sign. <laughs> Having an alligator on a leash, alligator named Champagne Charlie that he uh, uh, carried, uh, you know, took around the Harvard Yard, as staging grand fireworks events anyway. Um, when he was a junior, Harvard suggested that um, he return at another time, and so he actually never graduated. <laughs> and um, it's surprising how unfazed he was by this little setback, because Harvard did have one big uh, influence on him, and that was newspapers. Were treated to this. Oh, there we go. Phoebe was uh, devastated, you know. But they they given W R the job of the business. Um, editor of the Harvard Lampoon. It always bled money and he was the richest boy on campus. But he made it pay. And that was his first whiff of printer's ink and the beginning of falling in love with his other great passion, which was journalism. The East Coast, not so much. He wrote Phoebe that he hated its weak, pretty scenery. <laughs> it's general insides, it's vistas. He said, I hate it um, like a face without force or character. I long to see the jagged rocks, the towering pines, the grand, majestic scenery of the far west. And then he said, I like to leave it for a little while so I can enjoy it more when I return. And we are truly here in a time capsule that captures exactly the views that WR had you know, of this magnificent scenery of the far west. He was very interested in a beautiful young protege of Phoebe's and, you know, she, if she was going to have protégés and, and make them that beautiful, my goodness. And uh, Phoebe was not interested in having an actress for a daughter-in-law. And so after Harvard, they shipped him rather hastily down to Mexico. Where they had a very big cattle ranch called Papica Run. Um, and it figures in here because the cattle actually made a migration a lot of the time between San Simeon and Holon and Papica Run, which was in um, uh, Chihuahua. In Mexico by you know taking them by train, so he knew uh, Calaranchi intimately. He did um, give up the girlfriend, and he was given the San Francisco Examiner in 1887. It was a second-rate newspaper. The family legend is won in a poker game by his father, uh, but it, but it was his um, heart's delight, and he eventually ended up owning 28 daily newspapers, 14 magazines, eight radio stations, two film companies. A payroll of 38,000 people, an unbelievable influence on American political and cultural thought. George Hurst, as I said, had his own influence because he became a senator, but he died um, in office in 1891. Um, and he was celebrated as a man who, even though he'd become a bonanza king, he never lost that kind of country simplicity that he always had. Some habits die hard, and William Randolph Hearst fell in love with another actress. Um, her name was Millicent Wilson. She was a very lovely woman. And Phoebe wasn't exactly thrilled about it at the beginning, but she grew very fond of her daughter-in-law. And there they are on their honeymoon, W.R. and Millicent. Um, they, they wed um, in 1903, just on the eve of his 40th uh, birthday. He actually was turning 41 the next day. Um, and she was 19, so very much like his family um, and his parents had done before. He took her whole family on a trip abroad. And um, I've been so fortunate to have um, a very gifted photographer at Hearst Castle, who's taken a lot of these beautiful shots, and then also to have access to the Hearst archives, which are extensive. This is a honeymoon. I mean, W.R. took this photo from, you know, per Pershon Rock. I don't know if they're in um, Amalfi or Capri or whatever, but doesn't it look like Big Sur? <laughs> That's what I was saying. It's a superimposition of all the things he loved about Europe with all the things he loved about um, California. And this photograph we could actually turn into a novel if we wanted because there is a very terrified daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law and the electric current between them is the first grandchild. 
And as I said, they became great allies. That's George's. Eventually, Millicent and William Randolph Hearst had five sons. And Phoebe, as I said, she grew very, very fond of Billy. But with the boys, W.R. wanted to spend more time at the ranch the way he had. So I've just fast forward us about 20 years. And there's Millie. Um, and in the 19 teens, they would come up and camp just the way he had done in his boyhood. Except that te technology had advanced a bit from then. Oh, there we go. And so they shot movies. Oops. And um, W.R. started them. <laughs> you had a brief one, so I want you to see him again. There he is. As John Jenkins, the hero. He wrote the titles, he did the direction. This was the summer activity. He said, the hero gets the fattest part and also gets the glory. But that's because he runs the ranch and also writes the story. <laughs> By um, treacherous bandits who then tied their victim to a tree. <laughs> So Millicent could be rescued, you know, by John Jenkins. So it was always a place of, of uh, tremendous joy for her. So he wanted it to be for his five sons. And the family have carried that through. Um, they all say no matter where, they get their mail. San Simeon is their home. And um, they've been incredibly generous sharing it. Uh, but they all adore it with an absolute passion. And um, W.R. always felt that way, so uh, we even have photographs of the early tents. Phoebe never, he never could talk her into, into camping, but he did write to her in 1917. He said, I love this ranch. It is wonderful. I love the sea, and I love the mountains, and the hollows and the hills and the shade places and the creeks and the fine old oaks and the hot brushy hillsides full of quail, and the canyons full of deer, and I'd rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. And we have just that scenery outside. So um, he did enjoy it, but sadly Phoebe uh, died of the terrible influenza that came after World War I and killed more people than the war. Uh, so she died in April of 1919, and California came to a halt. She wasn't a native, but she was the greatest friend she restored the missions. She founded um, the Traveler's Aid Society. She built free kindergartens across the state. She um, uh, helped start the Save the Redwoods League. She wrote a blank check to the University of California so it would have a public campus. She gave $21 million to charity when there were no tax deductions as incentives. And she also introduced William Randolph Hearst to his future architect. Julia Morgan. Phoebe had befriended Julia Morgan, a young Californian who went to uh, college at Cal and wanted to pay when Morgan went to Paris to do her education. She became the first woman to graduate from a uh, fine arts architecture program that had, was the best in the world and had been founded in 1648. But Julia Morgan re uh, turned down Phoebe's offer of funds. She said, your faith, your faith in me is enough of a gift. But I think that's one of, we, it's got to rank right up there as one of the great things that Phoebe did, <laughs> was bringing these two remarkable people together. We wouldn't be sitting in this building otherwise. So they built San Simeon. Um, he inherited the land in 1919. They worked on many projects. He walked into her office and said he was tired of camping, getting tired of tents, and thinking of building a little something. <laughs> and that took 28 years. And she was very um, shy, but not timid. Um, and he called it, not the castle, but Casa Grande. It's a very big house, it's 115 rooms. And he called the estate, I told you it's the Piedra Blanca Rancho, but he called the hilltop estate La Cuesta Encantada, the enchanted hill, because of the uh, mist surrounding. And he filled it with wonderful art objects, and I hope you'll come visit us at San Simeon. I know Mary echoes that. This is one of the grand salons, the assembly room, full of Renaissance tapestries and furniture. But Mrs. Hurst was seldom part of the social scene. They married, but um, grew apart. 
And she lived in New York and Hearst lived with a young and beautiful actress most years. They were never, Mr. and Mrs. Hearst never divorced. And so um, Mrs. Hearst was Catholic. Uh, but they, so they were not able to marry, but they were together for um, more than 30 years. And this was Mary and Davies. And she is posing against an urn. She was vivacious and funny. You see Hearst in the center and Mary in the back of her head there in the dining room, which was always uh, a place of laughter um, and joy, even though it looked very much like a monastic dining hall. Maybe if you have been to the castle, you remember the bottles of ketchup and mustard that were grouped every four places, just so people remembered that this they're not in Europe. <laughs> this was a ranch. And what a ranch. You could stroll through magnificent gardens, which of course are still beautifully maintained by staff today, swim in spectacular swimming pools. Julie Morgan designed three dozen swimming pools. We don't even know if she knew how to swim, but man, did she know how to design swimming pools. This is the Roman plunge, and it's a vast, um, you know, fantastic spot. But um, it's it, perhaps upstaged by the Neptune pool, as they called the the one that faced west and was clad in um, classical uh, styles of Greece and Rome. We're in the midst of a vast uh, uh, restoration of the pool, so it's going to be empty for a little bit longer, but um, it'll be a grand day when it looks like this again. Hearst loved it, loved animals, and loved it when the guests got out and enjoyed the animals. Here's Marion with one of the uh, uh, animals in his extensive zoo. This is Mary Ann, the elephant. Um, he, he'd been an animal lover all of his life. He crusaded against laboratory experiments in animals, the use of rare birds and women's hats, uh, uh, rare bird feathers and women's hats, uh, uh, bullfights, the use of horses in, in the movie industry. You know, um, he absolutely loved animals. So yes, there were things like giraffes, of all things, and sensimia, as well as lots of grazing animals. Oops. Because this is the view from the front door of Casa Grande, straight out to you. Do you see in the distance that peak that's high on the right and low on the left? The very distant peak is Mount Junipero Serra. So it's just up there. And uh, beginning in 1921, very quietly, William Renover started buying up the small ranches of this region. He said about art auctions, when I sit on the floor of an auction, the price seems to keep going up. Well, it had to be the same with land, you know. So he didn't get it all at once, but he did buy this property. And by 1925, he had amassed that valley all the way. Um, you know, there were some private ranches here and there, but basically, he owned the view. This was an extremely conscious decision. And I know Julie Morgan knew it. She came to Holon, um, and, and to this region in 1925, and she wrote it. What a wonderful, beautiful domain. Indeed it was, because if, if, if this were 1789 or 1820, it, it looks the same. And it's a rare thing to look at this much magnificent California landscape and see it completely unchanged. I, I, this isn't a good photo, but I wanted to show you because it's a branding at San Miguelito Ranch, which is just down the road. This was built as a cattle ranch. Um, William Rutherford bought this land, and there were already, uh, from the Browns, and it already had a building. His ranch manager was this wonderful man named Don Francisco uh, Pancho, which was his nickname, Estrada. He's on the horse with his uh, pet cat, Getito. He was W.R.'s oldest friend. One of the Hollywood actresses said about how to heart attack one day, when this little old man came galloping up and said, Willie, come with me, I want to show you a pastor. She said, Willie? You know, even Marion called him W.R. I mean, the rest of us called him Mr. Hurst, for heaven's sakes. Who was calling him Willie? But he taught the Hurst sons, and he taught uh, the Hurst grandsons, and, you know, how to rope and ride. So, uh, Hertz knew his way around, W.R. knew his way around cattle, and he had some great cowboys as guests, and this is showing you the greatest one, the magnificent Will Rogers. Um, could do a whole discussion of just him alone with his remarkable talents as a humanitarian and artist, a pundit, um, an athlete, but also a tremendous, a movie star, but a tremendous cowboy. He said, if you've lost track of anyone, 
in the United States, they're probably at San Simeon as a guest at William Randolph first. <laughs> <laughs> then there were the less experienced cowboys, but awfully glamorous ones. This is Cary Grant. This has got to be a photo shot from a studio or something, right? He's got his shirt open to the waist. This uh, woman, Virginia Cheryl, became his first wife the next year. This is shot in 1932. So um, some of these people were cowpokes and some of them weren't. Some of them were what King Vito, who was a director who lived in Paso Robles, said, were some of the uh, most tenderfoot men and tender-bottomed women that he'd ever seen. <laughs> this on the right is Cecil Beaton, a great photographer who designed all the sets for My Fair Lady. And on the left is Anita Lose, and she was the great uh, novelist and screenwriter who wrote Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. We, uh, Beaton kept a diary. And he said, riding clothes were soon lent to me, and I fancied myself enormously. <laughs> well, as soon as he got on the horse and went to the first gate, he got a terrible rope burn that, as he said, throbbed like a tom-tom for the rest of his visit. Now, look at Randall first knew his way around the horse. He, he had a lot of places for riding, including up what Julie Martin called the longest pergola in captivity. It was more than a mile in length, this beautiful column to Arbor very near the castle. But for those who really wanted to ride, they come here. Of course, this is the lovely San Antonio mission. And um, William Randall first gave it $50,000 to restore it, but even before he did that, he gave it 20 acres of the land that he had bought. So it would be a larger building. Um, footprint. And then, of course, there was a half a million dollar gift to the Mission Foundation. And the Hearst family then and now are tireless supporters of the California missions in an unbroken line for uh, nearly 150 years. And there's where we are, at the Hacienda, as he called it. Now, when Julie Morgan built this, it was between 1929 and 1930, and it was meant to be the um, inland cattle ranch where they would bring the cattle to fatten them up on um, rich grasses before they uh, took them to market and drove them out to the, uh, out to the train. There was no electricity. None. They had gas in this room and that one. Otherwise, you lumped it. And it can get cold here. So this was really, you know, in the countryside. The ride was a long one, and some of the guests couldn't make it. Um, William Randolph Hearst actually had an all-weather road built. It leaves from San Simeon and passes extraordinary features like this dam and fish ladders for the steelhead, because Hearst Ranch is still an ongoing thing. It's 82,000 acres on which about 3,000 head of cattle still roam. But he had 300, he and then we later, had 300 miles of road built. And generally speaking, the plan was to ride the guests out here and then fly them back. Um, and he loved nothing better than taking some of these Hollywood movie stars and riding them right into the ground, even if he was 25 or 30 years their senior. He was saying, you play a cowboy. <laughs> I am a cowboy. But actually, the old weather road came because they couldn't even make it that one-way trip. Uh, parts of it are still there. Um, you know, they bridged the Nacimiento River. And the man who did a lot of the work was George Lures, who's here with LUR. He was a construction superintendent in 1932. And um, he also did some remodeling here at the Hacienda. And the last building that he worked on was a bunkhouse. And this is all on part of this private Curse Ranch property. Uh, Julie Morgan designed this, and I, I uh, the cowboys of the Hearst Ranch use it today. But I bring it up because, number one, it's got a structure very much like a smaller version of this hacienda, but also because they plan to build just such a bunkhouse here. Uh, but there was a problem, and that was money. <coughs> William Randolph first used to tell a story about a man, let's see if I can get this for me. he said, who had to call a dollar William because he was never going to know it long enough to call it Bill. <laughs> he spent a lot of money, and he got into debt. As a matter of fact, in his 70s, in 1937, 
he was more than $80 million in debt, and that's 1930s dollars. And so vast liquidations began. He sold art in department stores in New York, and that's when he sold this land. If you're wondering, for $16 an acre to the army, about 154,000 acres. But it's not the end of William Randolph Hearst's time at the ranch. He made money during World War II, and he came back for a final you know, um, episode of buying and building, a very joyful one. But his heart condition worsened in 1947, and at the age of 84, he left the ranch for the last time. As they flew away, they drove over these hills, and Marion said, don't cry, WR, we'll be, we'll be back someday. But, but he never was well enough. And he died on the 4th of August of 1951, at the age of 88. This is one of the uh, salon, you know, public rooms of, uh, for the family of the Hearst Ranch house and with a, a portrait by Howard Christie of William Randolph Hearst. And then um, in the dining room, you see, that's his father, his George Hearst in the photograph, sort of looking over his shoulder. Hearst was a very controversial man. I said he had a lot of political opinions and a lot of sway with his newspapers. When he died, he was celebrating for having changed the culture of America to such a tremendous degree with all, without holding very many public offices. He was a New York state legislator, but that was all. He wanted to be president, but that didn't happen. Um, but he did it in other ways, and he always knew that he wanted San Simeon to be shared. Um, and he hoped it would go to the University of California. That was his intention. That had been a family philanthropy uh, since, you know, all his life, almost. So this is the day he died with his beloved dog, Helen, down in Beverly Hills, in his first bedroom, and the portrait there is of Mary Davies. And she waited, you know, for her owner, who um, sadly never returned. Hearst did leave five sons, and um, from left to right, the bottom row, Bill Hearst, William Randolph Hearst Jr., was the second born. George is the little boy you saw before, the eldest son. Um, and there is John on the right. He's the third. And then these two are twins, though fraternal rather than identical. Uh, David and um, Randy. And um, so five, uh, five boys, and you see, as they call them, Pop, in the portrait behind. They all worked uh, in the Hearst Corporation. They were all instrumental in what happened next. The University of California said, thanks anyway, well, how are we going to pay for this? You know? And they decided uh, that they really could not afford to operate it. And um, so the decision was made to offer it to the Department of Parks, which was a very good decision, because just as you have done, this, the Department of Parks, uh, State Parks of California, has done an excellent job of restoring the place. So 120 acres at the top of the hill and 22 for the parking lot at the bottom were gift deeded. And this is what's so unusual, all the buildings and all their contents. There are many grand houses that get donated or repurposed, but they don't all have their contents. And at San City, we have nearly every single object in its original location, which is an extraordinary gift indeed. And um, I think William Randolph first would be very pleased at the final outcome. As I said, the, the life went on though, and the ranch continued around this 82,000 acres he still owned after he sold this land. And I wanted to show you, it says discard at the bottom. This was this, um, one of the plans they had for the little village um, where it showed, showed you the warehouses. But doesn't it look like here? You know, it's the, that whole mood. And actually, so I, you do have really close neighbors in these public, um, <coughs> in these buildings that never get is seen by the public. This is the poultry ranch manager's house. You see the castle up in the distance. That's now used as a headquarters for the Hearst uh, ranch manager. Now, poultry in WR's time had a very uh, l larger definition. They didn't eat penguins, but they did raise them as a part of his extensive zoo and aviary. But these buildings are absolutely beautiful. And Julie Morgan designed them, and you see the similarities, right? So it's at the bottom of the hill that you are really kissing cousins. And these buildings were built at the very same time between 1927 and 1930. The grandest of the houses along the bay was for Don Francisco Pancho Estrada, his closest friend. And the cattle ranch, as I said, 
goes on. It could be 1882, it could be 1922. Uh, the, you know, the cowboys still run in. But this is an unusual ranch because some of the zoo animals just managed to naturalize, you know. And I thought I'd throw some in because you might have encountered some of the ones that have really uh, thrived here. Now, zebras have this insurance policy. They think um, they should stick around the cows, figuring, I suppose, that they can always outrun a cow, right? If something's going to attack. But it's, it's a surprise if you're not expecting it. <laughs> on, on the highway one, the brakes screech and people jerk to the curb when they see this and cry. There are about 120 zebras at the moment. Um, but there are many more of these, what are called udads, or, or um, barber sheep. And these, you know, range, and they go, they go inland um, until summertime. Somehow, they know the difference between green grass and grass that is the color of their coat. And we do not see them until they match the grass. So my theory is they might be here. And, uh, because, you know, they do, they do not respect boundaries, and this was all part of the Hearst Ranch. So there are hundreds of them. Um, then we have some very rare um, survivors. This is a Himalayan targum. My fabulous photographer um, has also been at the castle for a long time, almost 20 years. Her name is also Victoria uh, Garagiano. I put this on a list of things I wanted her to shoot. I've been at the castle 35 years. I've seen this animal once. She, shot, I, she did it. I don't know how. But anyway, so we have some very rare species that are more reclusive. And we have these very large deer. And you might see these too because they have a lot of them. They're from India and they're called sambar. Um, and uh, they have a kind of a, they're brown, but they also have sort of cinnamon uh, markings. So if you see something that looks like the size of a moose but acts like a deer, it's probably a descendant of one of William Randolph Hearst sambar herd. <coughs> now, I told you they donated the top of the hill, but there were many plans through the Hearst Corporation, which is still a very active and very successful corporation. They own Lifetime, they own 20% of ESPN, they own 300 magazines, but you're familiar with a lot of them. You know, Cosmopolitan and Popular Mechanics and, and uh, Met uh, Metropolitan Home and Good Housekeeping. And, uh, so anyway, um, the plan was to monetize the property and turn it into um, a golf course and country club. This is one of the uh, drawings from the 60s. It's highway one. <coughs> Would have uh, you know, gone straight. And then there were going to be residences and then the, the little village. <coughs> At times, the hotel was going to be as large as 670 units. And they were planning a 28 whole golf course. Nothing against hotels or golf courses, but we sure have a lot of them. And we've only got one piece of beautiful, accessible coastline that's not a sheer rock cliff and is available to everyone. And things really changed in 1998 when another great grandchild of William Randolph Hearst, Stephen, and here's his father, George Randolph uh, uh, Hearst Jr. He's the son of the oldest Hearst son, so he's the youngest grandson. He sadly died uh, in, in, in 2012. But Steve came on as the head of the Western Properties in 1998, and with a lot of help from a lot of people in the community as well as within the company and the family, they decided, sorry, to save the coastline. It was uh, a very difficult fight and very contentious with so many competing voices. But finally, what the New York Times called the most complicated land deal in the entire history of the United States was signed in February of 2005. What it did was take the Hearst Ranch and put it under a permanent conservation easement. It will always be run as a ranch, and um, it's not it's overseen, of course, by Hearst, but it's also um, reviewed by an independent agency, the, uh, the California Rangeland Trust. Nothing will be built on the ocean side of Highway 1. Uh, nothing will ever be built that is visible in Europe. They have the right to build a small number, very small number, of homesteads in, at some future time if it all passes review uh, with the Coastal Commission and all other authorities. They took the coastline, 13 miles of it, and gave it to the people of California. Gave it. So it was an extraordinary thing. It added 16 miles to the California Coastal Trail. 
and it's there for all of us to enjoy, and they don't plan, and the state parks uh, is administering it, they don't plan to do a thing. They're not gonna put in bathrooms and asphalt parking. It's gonna look like this from now on. And it's a remarkable thing that each of these steps has been finalized, you know, in the last 150 years. With a castle that Hearst said, I'm building for a thousand years. You can see why he called it the Enchanted Hill. Now uh, owned by the people of California. But also, sorry, the, the Hacienda. Because it's owned by the government and all of us as well. And you've done a wonderful job of taking care of what really was a very special part of the Piedra Blanca Rancho. Thank you. information. Um, as a small token of the appreciation for the Hearst Castle support in this event, the command group would like to present Ms. Lockhoff and Ms. Kastner with flowers and certificates of appreciation. Could you join us at this point? Nice. <laughs> In appreciation and recognition for your exceptional support to the Fort Hunter Liggett 75th anniversary celebration on 24 September 2016, your participation as a guest speaker contributed immensely to the success of our milestone event and made this a truly special occasion for all concerned. Your willingness to serve in this capacity and contributions to our community are greatly appreciated and you have my deepest gratitude, Jan C. Norris, Colonel, is C, Commander. Mary, Mary Levkoff, in appreciation for your generous support to the Fort Hunter Liggett 75th anniversary celebration on 24 February 16, your contributions to the celebration of assisting with historical photographs from the Hearst Museum and coordinating the Hearst Castle tours provided historical context and enhanced our presentation. Your contribution to our community is greatly appreciated and you have my deepest gratitude. Jan C. Norris, Colonel, SC, Commanding. Patterson and Ms. Vanessa Olson to join the folks up front, ladies. Uh, with the folks. Let you all know that the Come on over here, my friend. I'll let you in. <laughs> so come on in, squeeze in a little bit here. This is a military tradition we have. Everybody can go ahead and put their your hands right here. I did take fencing, but did you? Was I know, Saber was not allowed. Saber's to not one of them, so, <laughs> so we'll go ahead and uh, at the count of three, we'll just go in and chop into it straight down. One, two, three. Yeah. 